morning, everybody, and welcome to our session on guidelines. We're going to be reviewing some important documents uh, that have been released in the last year or two. Um, I am joined by my co-moderator, Dimitri Feldman, on the other side, and I'm going to just go through the uh, panelists, and Dimitri, you can take over when, <laughs> when we get to your side. So we've got Dr. Mauricio Cohen, Dr. Simon Dixon, Dr. Jennifer Reimer, and uh, you want to take over there? Yes, and, and, and thank you. And so on this side, we have Dr. Andrew Klein and Dr. Lorenzo Zalini. Um, and I'm, uh, it's also my pleasure and an honor to come moderate with Dr. Jacqueline Thomas Holland. Uh, this is a section on uh, guidelines, and we have a number of very exciting talks by the experts, by people who've been involved in writing SKY, ACC, AHA guidelines. Um, and the first talk will be by my co-moderator on coronary revascularization guidelines, the take-home messages by Dr. Tamis Holland. Okay. So where is the... Okay, so good morning. And so I had the task of going through 136 recommendations in 10 minutes. And also, Manos wanted a case presentation to go with it. So uh, good luck to me. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the 2021 REVAS guidelines which was released in December 2020. It is a combination of the former PCI and CABBAGE guidelines. And what it does is it really patient focuses on the patient. So rather than saying we have a procedure, how do we do it? Instead we say we have a patient and what do we do to manage this patient? And so for this reason, we combine the two and really look at the best way to treat a person with coronary artery disease. So I'm gonna start with a case. I have a 50-year-old man who has diabetes. He presents with 12 hours of waxing and waning chest pain. He has diaphoresis and nausea. His 12 lead EKG shows inferior wall ST elevations and he has some reciprocal changes. And he comes to the cath lab and the more you look, the more you see. He has a severe distal circ, he has a severe OM1, OM2, posterior lateral. You can see in here that you can see the LAD is diseased and you can see the diagonal is hanging by a thread. He has a severely uh, severe diagonal branch here, you can see again, and severely diffusely diseased LAD. And then he has, interestingly, the culprit lesion is the one that's the least severely diseased, but he has severe disease of his right coronary artery as well. Timmy 3 flow, but he's still having ongoing pain and ST elevation, so we take him and go ahead and do a PCI of his right coronary with good results. And, you know, his hospital course is unremarkable. He has a, a troponin peak of 16. He has uh, regional wall motion abnormalities, but a preserved EF. And he goes home on post-op day three. This is 2020 COVID pandemic. And we uh, pause to discuss how to treat them. So my question to you guys, to the audience and to you guys, and I'm not going to wait for an answer because I have no time, um, is what would you do for this patient? So this is sort of food for thought about how will you manage the non-infarct artery. And now I am getting back to the guidelines. So um, sorry, I really don't have time to review everything, but what I decided to do is to focus on some of the either the newer recommendations or major changes or really important recommendations. So I chose a couple of these areas and I'm gonna be talking about these topics and then just give a brief shout out for some important recommendations, but there's no time to discuss. So. The REVAS guidelines has a whole new section on managing the non-infarct artery. So prior guidelines didn't really have that much to say about how to manage the non-infarct artery in STEMI. And now we have a class one recommendation to say that you should do staged PCI in a patient who had STEMI in a successful primary PCI as a class one recommendation. And this is based on a multitude of data, hence the level of evidence A, recommendation, but predominantly it's a complete trial, which was a trial of over 4,000 patients looking at multi-vessel staged PCI compared to culprit-only REVASC and demonstrating a reduction in both co-primary endpoints, death and MI and MACE, um, with complete revascularization. This was done as a stage procedure. Now, importantly, there were a lot of trials looking at multi-vessel PCI in STEMI over the last five to 10 years. 
These trials, I just want to point out, really very rarely enrolled patients with complex disease. So they either excluded or had very low enrollment of patients with CTOs, left main disease, vein graft disease, um, and very few, and the majority of the patients had triple, uh, double vessel disease, and few had triple vessel disease in these trials. So for this reason, we can extrapolate that class one recommendation for stage PCI in STEMI to all patients with multivessel disease in STEMI. And so for this reason, we have a 2A recommendation. It's a lower level of evidence because it's not really based on evidence, but logically, if you have very complex disease and you have a stable patient, do the PCI on the culprit vessel. And then if you have complex left main disease or complex disease, then consider doing a, an elective staged cabbage procedure. We also, of course, have a class three recommendation, just like ESC, um, for doing stage PC, a multivessel PCI on, a, on a, a patient in cardiogenic shock, and this is based on the shock trial, showing a higher event rate with multivessel PCI compared to culprit only, and this data was seen at one year as well with a higher event rate and a, a trend toward death, higher death in multivessel PCI. So let's summarize. I just want to be sure, because we were really careful about making sure we didn't sort of give a class one for every single non-culprit lesion. We want you to start by saying you did a successful primary PCI, and importantly, you have a stable appearing non-culprit. So those cases where you don't know where the culprit is because you have two ulcerated lesions in slow flow in both vessels, that would not apply for this particular case. But if you have a stable appearing non-culprit lesion and then you have a successful PCI, the majority of the time you're gonna pause and wait. And then you're gonna go on and look at the vessels. Is this vessel supplying a large area of myocardium at risk? A lot of the inclusion criteria was for 2.5 millimeters or more. It has to be a large vessel. And is there absence of comorbidities? And if there are, that is the case, then you go on to say, is there complex disease? If there's no complex disease of the non-infarct artery, then it's a class one to say do PCI as a stage procedure. But if there is complex disease, it's reasonable to consider cabbage or other options. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about left main disease because I think there's been a lot of confusion about the way the recommendations for left main disease because there's two separate recommendations in two separate parts of the document. So the document looks at if a person has coronary disease, one is, is there an indication for revascularization, either to improve symptoms or reduce um, mortality or improve survival? And then the other is, once you decide you're gonna do revask, what is the best mode to revascularize somebody? Which one would be the better approach? So the first recommendation on left main disease is, should you be doing it at all? Should, is there an indication to do it to improve survival? So it's a class one recommendation to say you should be doing cabbage to improve survival compared to medical therapy if you have left main disease, and it's a class 2A to say you should be doing PCI. Okay. Well, where do we get that data? Well, from CABBAGE, it's some older data of randomized controlled trials, but there really is no randomized controlled trial of PCI compared to medical therapy for left main disease. So where do we get this recommendation from? Well, we get it from a Bayesian meta-analysis that showed that with observational studies of PCI compared to medical therapy showed a similar proportional reduction in the events as that what was seen with cabbage compared to medical therapy, and that the randomized trials of PCI and cabbage are similar. So the, sim the thing is, if A is better than B, and A, equal, uh, and A equals C, then C is better than B. You know, that kind of logic is where you get the recommendation. So that is assuming that that you can achieve a similar result. So, it, so the recommendation specifically says, if you can achieve a similar result with PCI that you can achieve with cabbage, then you're doing PCI with the intent of improving mortality. Now we move on to the recommendations for comparing PCI and cabbage, and that's where uh, we have the recommendation, the class one recommendation to say, cabbage is preferred to PCI or should be performed compared to PCI if you have very high complexity disease. Okay, this is not for low to intermediate complexity. Notice there is no recommendation for low to intermediate complexity, and that's because they don't really feel that there's necessarily one is better than the other. But for high complexity disease, 
there is only really one randomized trial that looked at that, and that's the Syntax trial, because it's the only trial that includes patients with high complexity disease. And in the subgroup of patients with left main disease and a high Syntax score, you can see that MACE was higher with PCI compared to cabbage for left main disease, and you also saw a higher rate of cardiac death with PCI compared to cabbage. So again, going back to that, there is no recommendation to say that PCI or cabbage should be performed for low to intermediate complexity. You do what you think is best. But I would urge you to do what you think is best. Here is a meta-analysis that was published after the uh, guidelines were released, but it's a patient-level meta-analysis. Again, not showing any difference in mortality. So if you're looking at a survival benefit, like the recommendation is reporting out, there is no survival benefit with low to intermediate complexity left main, whether you do PCI or cabbage. But there is a higher uh, spontaneous MI rate, and there is a higher ischemia-driven revascularization rate or repeat revascularization with PCI compared to cabbage. And so there is some MACE benefit to cabbage compared to PCI, even the lower to intermediate complexity. And so this is a document that came out sort of as a result of the guidelines to really put people together and to say it was a room full of surgeons, a room full of interventional cardiologists and some clinical cardiologists to say, let's take each patient with left main disease individually and think about the best approach. If you have osteal or mid-shaft disease, I think either approach is good, but if you have distal bifurcation disease, even if it's low to intermediate complexity and you have a very low surgical risk, you really might want to consider cabbage, and if you have a higher surgical risk, you might want to consider PCI. Um, last uh, recommendation I just want to mention is the recommendation to reduce cardiovascular events. I think there's so much of an effort about what is the indication to improve mortality, but it's not always about mortality. It's about improving somebody's recurrence for a recurrent MI or repeat revascularizations for angina, et cetera. And while we cannot show that patients with normal EF and multivessel disease have an improvement in mortality with revascularization, we do know that multitude of studies have shown a better event, a lower event rate with revascularization with either PCI or cabbage compared to medical therapy. So there's a new two-way recommendation to reduce the risk of cardiovascular events with revasc. And this is one of the many studies, this is a meta-analysis. This meta-analysis didn't show an improvement in all-cause mortality, but there was a reduction in cardiovascular mortality with multivessel revascularization. Some studies were on PCI, some studies were on cabbage, but regardless of the modality, there is an improvement in outcome. Finally, a couple of shout outs. The other indication in which cabbage is preferred to PCI is in those patients with diabetes and multivessel disease if you're gonna put a lima to the LAD. And I know Mauricio and Sunil will kill me if I don't mention the class one recommendation for radial artery access. So that's a class one recommendation. So I think that there's a lot of new data coming out. In the last two years, we've had so many trials. And so I think the next iteration of the guidelines or next guideline updates is gonna to need to consider all these new trials and new indications um, and you know, reevaluate the data that we have on what, what our current guidelines say. Um, and I think that's it. I hope I finished close to 10 minutes. <laughs> That was terrific, terrific overview. <clears throat> I guess I'll open uh, for a couple of questions for, for the panelists. Um, that was a very uh, interesting and, and, and uh, a common case that we see, Jacqueline, the, the STEMI with multivessel disease. So the class uh, one level of evidence A recommendation is for stage cabbage. Um, let's say, I'll, I'll open it to panelists, if the culprit was a LAD, and LAD has been treated, and now the residual disease is all in the circumflex and the uh, RCA. What do we think about those patients specifically? Well, that's a very provocative scenario, of course. Um, we know that there are the guidelines and um, real-life patients. I mean, is it re uh, reasonable to bring to cabbage a patient that <clears throat> will not get a Lima, of course, and we don't only get uh, in real life, mainly SVGs to at least one of the two territories that you mentioned, the RCA and the circumflex. So this is surely something to consider. And I think that cabbage in 2023 should be um, uh, multi-arterial uh, revascularization procedure. Um, I would even dare to say um, complete arterial revascularization because this is what is superior to stents. But if we only are offering SVGs to, or mainly SVGs to our patient, I don't think we're gonna do him or her 
any good service because we know that those have a 50% um, risk stenosis and failure rate at 10 years, so we have much better stance. So coming to your scenario, Dimitri, I think that in that case we should proceed with PCI. Yeah, and I, I, I would totally agree, and I think that that's, the recommendation is a 2A is reasonable, and I think it's, that's why it's not a 1. I think we wanted to have that so it would make sure people didn't do multivessel complex left main disease PCI as a class 1 recommendation for stage PCI, but it's really a 2A for cabbage for that reason. You're probably not going to do it for somebody who has a preserved LED. Um, great, so I think we want to move on to the next you know, if uh, I can talk. Ask exactly, for one second, just for the audience, you know, there's any question, by the way, these are the people who wrote the guidelines. So if you have any questions you were dying to ask, now this is the time to ask it. And maybe before you move on, just one quick question, you'll be part of the guidelines and everyone is kind of concerned about the surgeon's response and everything, which I know is a sensitive topic, but anything you can share with us about the future and what are the plans for having combined guidelines or will be separate from now on? I have a question. Yeah, for Jackie. So, the, the mo which one was the most controversial guideline recommendation? So, I think we have to talk about that. <laughs> so, and I think the most controversial, um, the most controversial parts of the guideline was the downgrading of cabbage, because uh, the surgeons have been leaving on studies that have been done before you all, you know, most people here were born, and um, and in the in the time where beta blockers were rarely used, uh, aspirin was rarely used, and there was no there were no statins. So they felt uh, very uh, aggravated by the fact that uh, cabbage was uh, downgraded from a class one in the previous guidelines to a class two B. Do you want to expand? <laughs> yeah. So I, I, you know, it's interesting because you, you come in and. Uh, you know, so the rule is that if there's no new evidence, you don't change it. Um, but even when you look back at the evidence from 40 years ago, there were three main trials, okay? CAS was negative. It did not show a benefit to cabbage at all for all comers. The VA cooperative did show a benefit, but when you looked at the subgroup of patients with normal ejection fraction and triple vessel disease, there was no benefit. And so there was really only one trial in our entire lifetime that showed a benefit to cabbage compared to medical therapy to improve survival with triple vessel disease. And so I think that there is just so much hype from those trials from 40 years ago, and we have many studies. That meta-analysis I showed was a meta-analysis of all the trials, including the early cabbage trial, and again, not showing a benefit to cabbage. So I think it's, you know, it wasn't so much, oh, as a downgrade, you really almost want to relook at the, the original recommendations and wonder whether it deserved a one anyway. But now, like you said, in contemporary times, I think it's really you know, hard to argue that with when there was no aspirin, no, no beta blockers, no stat, well, some beta blockers were being given and some antiplatelets, but no statins, I think it's very hard to say. And I liken it to a very interesting, somebody said this once, like when they used to use surgery to take care of peptic ulcer disease, you know, and now we have better treatment, so you're not going to go back and say, well, that study from 40 years ago showed a benefit to taking out the stomach for peptic ulcer disease. I mean, you know, that's kind of a little harsh, but I think we need to say we have really good medical therapies. But again, there is a reduction in cardiovascular events, and that's why we have a 2A recommendation. And that recommendation was not initially in the guidelines, right? That was added after the, uh, after the reviews from the surgical societies. Yeah, um, I think that we, you know, I think that we reevaluated all of the evidence and brought that in, that recommendation in. Yeah. No surgeons. I want to second uh, Manos's comments. If anybody has questions, there's a microphone at the front. Manos has a microphone, so please don't be shy. Um, we'll have some more time for. Qu Go ahead. Thank you so much. So. I think the, the question I have in mind when I see every time that the, the left main intervention is second to cabbage whenever it's complex or distal bifurcation, this is based on older uh, technology though. And when will we see at least the, there is a caveat in the guidelines or there is a, a conservative uh, statement about that the outcomes that led to believing that limited LEDs way too superior uh, to bifurcation stenting or uh, distal lift main um, um, black modification or uh, calcium modification followed by imaging guided single stent strategy and maybe some DCB to side branch or now lysotripsy available in the USA 
or IFR to the side branch was, was, was just one single stent. That may lead to a better outcome down the line, less revascularization need and overall uh, better um, uh, durability of the BCI option, which is not translated in the uh, current uh, uh, data or in the trials that was were used in the guidelines, uh, at right. least for the time being. I mean, this in-text trial was, was an old trial, and it's the only evidence we have, but even the more contemporary, and you're right, they're already 10 years old, but the more contemporary trials used somewhat newer newer techniques, and I think, unfortunately, you know, we, we I think most of us in the room would agree that it's, if it's extremely complex left main disease and the patient's a good surgical candidate, that surgery is appropriate. Um, it's, I think that the, the difference is that we have a recommendation for the patient, you know, informed decision making, right? So if the patient's absolutely insisting against it, or if the patient's a very high surgical risk, then it's not unreasonable to, it's not like you can't say, I can't do PCI. But um, I think we would all say that it's clinically in the patient's best interest to get cabbage. If they're a good surgical candidate, they are okay with cabbage and they have very complex left main disease. That's Jack my own feeling. One question. Why was imaging, intravascular imaging given such a low recommendation, I think 2A or 2B? Yeah, so I, I, I think I put up in my last slide, I think there's a lot of new data that supports it. Um, the, when you looked at the data at the time we were reviewing the evidence, you know, a 2A means that there's definitely benefit, but it, you, 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 it's usually not involving a mortality benefit. Um, so in this particular case, imaging, there was no, there was no data to show a, a lower, from randomized control trials to show a lower mortality with intravascular imaging. I think that their meta-analyses now and newer trials suggest otherwise. So, um, you know, perhaps that will be changed. But at the time, we didn't just didn't have enough evidence to say that it was achieving a mortality benefit. Just, just a quick comment on the, uh, the imaging in, in Michigan State as part of the BMC2 consortium. Um, uh, imaging as part of the PCI is one of the important quality metrics for the state with a goal of having more than 40% of PCIs at each institution be performed with, with OCT or IVIS imaging based on the strength of the evidence. What's the metric, 40%? 40%. Yeah. That's great. All right. All right, I think we do need to move on, and I guess Mauricio and I are happy to discuss more, more questions about the guidelines off, offline. So we've got Dr. Timothy Henry, and he's going to be talking about another, gosh, I wish you gave us more time, Manos, because we have a lot to discuss, but he's going to be talking about another really provocative uh, statement, which is on the position statement on how to manage patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest in the cath lab. Yeah, so what I'm going to try to do to concentrate on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and on data that we know. And actually, there's been some really good trials in the last few years on out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that make a difference. I have no disclosures related to this. And I do, from when, when we talk about case, yesterday, Bob and I were saying, why do we do this, cardiogenic shock, STEMI, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? And I'll tell you, for me, sometimes it's personal. So on the left side was my grandfather sitting next to uh, to the right of JFK, and he died of acute MI when he was um, about 62. There's no way he would die today. And on the right side is my father, who um, five years ago died of an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. So that's why we do it, because we need to set up systems of care that actually can keep these people from dying. So out-of-hospital cardiac arrest is still a huge problem. Very difficult to know how many people die, but it's probably between 300 dollars and $500,000 um, uh, patients a year. And the mortality used to be uh, less than 10%. But one of the issues with cardiac arrest, when you look at the trials, it depends on how you start counting. So if it's um, uh, patients who are just out of hospital cardiac arrest, how many got CPR, how many survived to the hospital, how many were discharged alive, or how many had no neurologic consequences. So when you read trials, you need to understand where they started with, okay? Let's go forward. So this is, before 2010, consistently less than 10% survival. Then all of a sudden, in 2010, a number of things happened, and you can see then it changed to 60% survival with 90% um, uh, neurologically intact. So what made the difference? First of all, it's really important to know early CPR, AEDs, and, and um, um, a better CPR made a huge difference and will continue to make a difference. It's the mainstay of what we do. 
But <clears throat> we published a paper, and actually about five or six years ago, that really still, um, uh, I think, holds true. Uh, this was in Jack, and if you look on the left side, when you talk about auto hospital rest, there we divide it into two things: ST elevation or non-ST elevation. Now, I'll tell you, it's much more complicated than that because when you really look at EKGs and auto hospital cardiac arrest, a third are clearly ST elevation, a third are clearly normal, and a third you can't tell. I mean, think about what you've seen. And so I think that middle category is still very difficult. But the important point is if you have ST elevation, you should go to the cath lab and PCI and the appropriate person. If you uh, uh, do not, we're going to talk about it in a minute. In the middle are unfavorable uh, resuscitation features, unwitnessed arrest, um, no bystander CPR, greater than 30 minutes to ROSC, ongoing CPR, pH less than 7.2, lactate greater than 7, age greater than 85, uh, and end-stage renal disease. Those are important, they're still true, they're bad outcomes, and you need to take them into the uh, equation. So, important, how often does this happen? So this is a registry from the Tomahawk trial that looked at consecutive out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that got admitted. Remember, a lot of these patients don't get admitted. 31% had STEMI, 69% had another EKG pattern, and I like the fact that they didn't just say normal, because they're not just normal. So about a third of the patients will have ST elevation. Now the advantage of going, who should we take to the cath lab? This is a really big a point. You guys get called about this at two o'clock in the morning, right? So <clears throat> the advantage of going to cath lab, a lot of these patients have coronary disease, that you might prevent myocardial injury, especially if it's a culprit artery. The con about going is that you can delay diagnosis, or you, and number two, you take brain dead patients to the cath lab that are, aren't going to recover. So what they did is a really important trial. This is the COAC trial in, uh, that had 552 patients out of hospital cardiac arrest without ST elevation. Immediate, immediate to the cath lab or delayed, and here's what happened, 90 day survival. Uh, who went in? First of all, ST elevation, hemodynamically unstable, were, so cardiogenic shock were excluded. Refractory arrhythmias were excluded. Um, a non-cardiac cause of death uh, arrest were excluded. And, and a CNS uh, injury was excluded. So these are really out of hospital cardiac arrest, normal EKGs, and no difference. 67% survival, no reason to go to the cath lab for these patients. This was actually repeated. Um, this is the Tomahawk trial, no difference. So if you get called and there's a normal EKG, wait. Patients that recover can go to the cath lab and can get revascularized electively. So I think that's a really important thing. And then the guidelines, another really important part with a cardiac arrest, half of cardiac arrest patients will have cardiogenic shock and vice versa. And there's definitely an interaction. And so if you look at every stage of cardiogenic shock, at every stage of the shock stage, having cardiac arrest markedly increases your mortality. So this interaction is a really important issue. So um, if you look, and then the final point about uh, randomized trials are the arrest trial. This is the no ROSC patient. This is a person you stop CPR. So if you think about this, this is person would be dead. And um, Demetrius Yanopoulos did a trial, you know, the randomized patients to immediate ECMO and PCI versus stopping just standard CPR. And this is the results of the trial. Uh, basically, they stopped the trial early after 30 patients because it was 50% survival versus zero. This is not simple. It's not for the faint of heart. It really is a community thing to decide, and it's very specialized patients. So these, I'm going to end now with this is the consensus statement that takes into account what we had. Very complicated, but I think the point is this. If you have ROSC and you're awake and you have ST elevation, those patients should go to the cath lab. If you have non-ROSC and it's an unknown neurologically recovery, if you have ST elevation, you should go to the cath lab. If you have a normal EKG, you should wait. 
All right, and then the non-ROSC, the ongoing CPR, are based on, on the arrest. And these are the favorable versus unfavorable things that we talked about, and I think these are the strategies that we've said. So in the final point of the guidelines is that we should have cardiac arrests, cardiac shock centers, and we should have standardized protocols the way that we go through them. So thank you very much. Tim, thank you so much. That's really, really a great uh, summary. I think there's a lot of uh, opinions out there about how to manage cardiac arrest. I think it's pretty easy when you talk about the patient without, I think we're comfortable saying without ST elevation. I'll give you the other extreme. and I'd love to know what the panelists think too. Um, what do you do in patients who have ST elevations, clearly ST elevations, but they're those ones that are arriving 50 minutes after onset? I think you know, it, it's a hard thing. Love to know your thoughts. and Love to know the panelists' uh, thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I still think, um, personally, um, I think it's uh, one really important point that for an individual patient, it's very hard to predict who's going to wake up and who are not. And what I didn't talk about, because it's not enough time and it's too controversial, is targeted uh, temperature management. And I, I, where do we go? I, I think we still cool but we don't cool as, as uh, cold as we did before. And I think the most important point is to avoid temperature. But I think with um, TTM and early cath with STEMI patients, you know, we end up with survivals that are you know, 60, 70% neurologically intact. And you, the information that you have at the moment they arrive in the cath lab is not always accurate. So personally, I err on the side. If you have SC elevation, you should go to the cath lab. Okay. All right. Let so me ask one more question to the panelists. Um, for patients that present with out-of-hospital arrest, no clear ST elevations, no clear neurological status, as, as Dr. Henry clearly showed, delayed management is, is preferred, but what does delayed management mean? How long do you wait? Do you wait for neurological recovery, cardiovascular recovery? I'll ask my colleague to the left, Dr. Klein, very high volume and experienced operator. Uh, thanks, Dimitri. I think, you know, in today's world of reportable events, too, I mean, e e you know, your PCI mortality gets reported, and so I think it, at least it does at our institution, and you got to be pretty cognizant about when you're going to take somebody. So for, for us, it's generally you got to wake up. you got to show a, pro a positive prognostic event from neuro, unless they have VT or some other reason that's pushing your recurrent ST elevation. Uh, for us, the patient has to wake up and demonstrate, you know, an, a a good recovery from a neurological, T of course, TTM delays that a little bit, so you gotta wait. So it's at least three days. Tim, what, how long is it in your institution? Yeah, no, completely agree with that. You know, first of all, it depends on how old people are and all the situation, including the family situation. And I think you, what you, this is where having a um, heart team approach. One thing I would tell everybody here is, this decision is all, I mean, everybody's been put in that decision at 3 a.m., right? and your, your, your ER doc wants you to come in and take this patient to cath lab. This, now we have data, this should be a discussion you have at two o'clock in the afternoon, and your hospital should have a standardized protocol, and the ER, because I think it's a really important thing that we know the non ST elevation, out of hospital cardiac arrest, should go to the ICU and stabilize, and patients who wake up, whether it's two days or five days, you can do safely do a cath if you need to later. That's really changed our life. And that's really an important one because not taking someone with a rest to the cath lab at 4 a.m. is a big deal. Yeah, and, and, and Drew touched on, on an important issue of the public reporting, especially in the East Coast, uh, in New York and Massachusetts. This was an issue. Initially, the, the physicians uh, were not taking patients uh, with out-of-hospital arrest as quickly, perhaps, based on ST elevations and other criteria as you discussed, as, as they should have. Um, and taking that out of the equation, excluding those patients, was the right thing to do. So now it's really back in physicians' hands to decide what the algorithm should be, and, and that shouldn't prevent us from, from taking patients to the cath lab. I think we're gonna, uh, Jennifer, you had a question? Yeah, just, just to add a couple things. So I, I think that actually when they have ST elevations, that makes it much easier some, in some ways. It's those patients, and I think you nicely outlined, there's that bucket of patients that have really unfavorable 
um, sort of presentations. Lactate that's off the sort of the assay, pH that's extremely low, maybe are early signs of posturing already. I'm curious your thoughts about this. I'm oftentimes faced with those patients that had extreme lengths of sort of out of hospital arrest. I know, everyone else knows that their survival is extraordinarily low. If I do TTM, at least at my hospital, our algorithm is at least 72 hours before any prognostication can occur. And for families and for medical care, that can oftentimes sort of kick the can downstream a bit. So is there ever a situation in those patients where you would sort of say, not going to pursue TTM? Yeah. So I, so I agree with all of that. And I think uh, it, a lot of the people that in that group you're just talking about have EKGs that are unclear, you know, wide comp. It's a post arrest EKG and you can't tell. And I think that group, people, you take time and you wait and stabilize. And then I really think the poor predictors, end stage renal disease, more than 85, pH under 6, 7, lactate over 10, you know, these are really bad predictors. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to the next uh, very important topic. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Poonam Belgapudi, who will speak to us about Sky Expert Consensus Statement on PCI without on-site surgical backup. So, all right, this, um, it's very hard to summarize the whole thing in five minutes, as uh, Jackie was mentioning, but I'll try to do my best and um, just summarize a little bit. So, this is going to be the outline of my talk. I'm going to review the 2014 guidelines, the need to update the, those guidelines and review some of the 2022 updates and discuss how facilities were classified, how operators uh, were classified, and then what lesions should be undertaken in which center. So according to the 2014 guidelines, these guidelines were um, uh, issued at the time uh, when we didn't have much data about uh, PCI at no SOS facilities. So the uh, recommendations were a bit conservative, and um, a lot of lesions that nowadays we perform with minimum complications were excluded. So for example, anything more than moderate calcium and anticipated need for rotor, cutting balloon, or laser, um, just as an example, were some of the lesions that were excluded in that um, yeah, guidelines paper. So what was the need to um, update the 2014 guidelines? Um, we are performing more and more complex PCIs. Our techniques have gotten better. Our equipment has gotten better. And then our complications have decreased. Um, and so this is really important that we are able to perform um, a little more complex cases in um, no surgical uh, backup facilities. And then the lower complication rates. We're seeing in NCDR, the perforation rates are about less than 0.5%. Our vascular complications are less than 1.5%. And even at the VA, we see lower complications, uh, like less than 1%. So um, it's really important that, um, you know, the, that these procedures have been performed safely at these centers, and so we got to um, up our uh, game. So global versus U.S. data, um, not only do we have data from the U.S., but we also have data from other countries, U.K., Canada, uh, Dutch, Polish, so many other countries that have shown that the um, outcomes of patients who uh, got PCI at these no-SOS facilities has been really good. And then um, to, in 2020, CMS has um, uh, in included the coverage of PCI in ASCs, and so we got to keep that in mind. And there's also this operator legal risk. So if our guidelines paper says you can do these lesions, and for if, for instance, something was done and a, a complication had to happen, then the op uh, operator is obviously at um, uh, risk. So there's um, two important studies that um, the randomized trials that actually compared outcomes between um, uh, PCI at surgical and non-surgical facilities. One of them is the CPO trial that probably most of you know, and then other is the MassCom trial. So the CPO trial, um, the outcomes of the two, it was a non-inferiority trial and um, outcomes at six weeks and nine months uh, between PCI at the two, uh, at surgical and non-surgical facilities was not different. So um, this is a, a important trial that kind of uh, set the stage for PCI at no SOS centers. So these are the highlights of the 2020 guidelines. Um, the uh, facilities were classified as a uh, OBL or ASCs, and then they, the non-surgical facilities are class one and class two, and then the fourth group is the uh, surgical facilities, uh, facilities with surgical backup. So talked about equipment and supplies and um, transfer agreements. So 
the important uh, thing about the transfer agreement is that um, the facilities that have do not have a surgical backup must have some sort of a transfer agreement with facilities with surgical backup, and they, um, they need to be um, uh, prepared to transfer patients within 30 minutes uh, if a complication were to occur and uh, the patient needed surgery. And then quality assurance was a big um, uh, thing. You know, all these centers should have some sort of a quality, um, um, uh, like participating in NCDR and then doing their own quality improvement um, uh, uh, activities. Informed consent is a big one. Uh, patients getting um, these procedures at no surgical facilities must be explained all the risks and the risk or need for transfer in case something were to happen. And then I'll talk a little bit, I'll show you the operator requirements, um, and then staff obviously must be well trained um, in all uh, resuscitative efforts. Surgical consultation is a big one, um, particularly in patients who have um, intermediate or high risk, uh, high syntax scores. Ad hoc PCIs are discouraged, and um, having this, even if it's a virtual or um, some sort of a surgical consultation before taking on uh, procedures at no SOS facilities is important. Um, I'll talk about the cases and uh, what we can and cannot take on at no surgical facilities. And then these are some of the, um, I've listed the criteria that have been regarded as high risk um, and should not be attempted at uh, uh, ASCs and OBLs, but a little bit on a, uh, at a higher uh, facilities. And then reimbursement and economic considerations were discussed. So this is the operator experience table that I was talking to you about. So the experience has been classified as a new interventional cardiologist experienced and very experienced. So anybody with less than three years of experience um, is a new interventional cardiologist. And uh, these, uh, the new uh, interventional cardiologists are not recommended to be doing all these cases in um, no surgical uh, backup facilities. But as the experienced is anyone over three years, um, and then very experienced is over 10 years and who's able to perform all kinds of procedures. So this is the um, flow chart. Um, I think this is the most important slide and um, that I will go through step by step. So in the beginning, uh, the first on the top is patients for planned cath PCI with a very experienced interventional cardiologist. Um, because that's the experienced cardiologists are the ones who are recommended to do these procedures in OBLs and ASCs. So let's, uh, the three important things to look for is, is, is the uh, PCI for a last remaining vessel? Is it a retrograde epicardial uh, CTO? So those two things, if the answer is yes and the patient is a surgical candidate, then they should have their PCI performed at a surgical facility. Then move, moving down, if if those, they don't meet that criteria, then the important other things like CTOs, um, are unprotected left main or degenerated vein grafts or reduced EF or planned atherectomy. If answer to any of these is a yes, then they go to PCI to hospitals without SOS, but they need to have a little higher level of uh, support. So they need to have PVADs and ECMO available. So that would be level two uh, for no SOS. All right, the next step would be to ask if the patient, if there's any patient risk factors, high transfusion risk, high baseline respiratory risk, AKI, or high vascular complication risk, if the answer to those is yes, then you would want um, to do these cases in a no SOS, but level one. And if the answer to all those questions on the left side is a no, then they are okay to be done in an OBL or um, ASC facility. So this is, uh, this is the classification for the facilities. The left ASC OBL, there's no ICU, there's no code team, and there's no blood bank. And the only support that's available would be a uh, balloon pump. The no SOS facilities, level one and level two. Level one would have um, you know, lower volume with um, uh, balloon pump support available. And level two are those who we have experienced ICs, higher volume, you would have multiple cath labs and there is ICU, but a little bit of higher support. So anybody with PVADs, ECMO, and all those are classified into level two. And then finally, the surgical facilities that have transplant, cardiopulmonary bypass, surgical um, uh, teams and shock teams, et cetera, so the highest level of care, and they're doing structural procedures as well. So what's changed in terms of plaque modification devices? Really, IVL was added. Um, we added IVL to all the four facilities um, because the from the disrupt CAD data, you know, the, the, out, the complication rates were really low and pretty uh, safe to use the IVL balloon, so that was the new thing that was added. And what cases can be taken up? Um, again, we, I 
just discussed to you in the table earlier. The important ones that should not be taken up at the ASC OBL are the epic epicardial retrograde CTOs and the last remaining vessel conduits. Those have to be at a higher level of um, level two facilities. Otherwise, the others um, can be taken up at a level one um, hospital. So take home uh, is that the complexity of CAD is increasing and our complication rates are decreasing. Uh, PCI at facilities with um, out surgical uh, backup are safe without increased need for surgery. The 2022 guidelines um, for these, we expanded the lesion subsets that can be treated at these facilities and have a uh, clear um, description of operators or um, other uh, things that can be done. And then operators, again, it comes down finally to the judicious uh, discussion and uh, it comes to the uh, operators really judicious decisions about which patient needs to be done and not, but um, this is a, a great um, way to decide which ones, which cases can be done at a PCI facility. Again, the most important thing is that this doing um, cases in a no SOS facility is increases the patient's um, ability, the reach to patients, more satisfaction, and probably even cuts costs in um, most often times. And so I think this is, uh, if these cases can be done safely, it's a, a, a great development in our PCI world. That's great, thank you. Do, Drew, do you have something? Yeah, you want to no, I on? just have a question for you. In those guidelines, I think you know as we see uh, more movement out of the ASCs and, and OBLs, especially in the recent events on the New York Times, um, is there anything recommending mandatory reporting of quality outcomes? And and I think all of us are a little concerned about the quality outcomes that are going to occur in ASCs and OBLs, especially in the settings of what has occurred in other vascular beds. So that's a great question. So the OBLs are um, guided by state require the state guidelines, and then the ASCs have the state as well as M Medicare um, related uh, guidelines. So they they are a little bit more stringent. But the recommendation is to be participating in an NCDR or a quality registry. I don't know. There is a new um, um, something for the peripheral. But the, the recommendation is to participate in, a, in something like NCDR and continuously improve the outcomes um, based on even their own data. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, just if, if I may, just add a couple key points. So for all of those in the room, if you look, um, Sky has m uh, markedly increased our focus on consensus statement, expert opinions, and guidelines. Uh, we've never been more active. We have, and we've had a good relationship with the Canadian Association of Interventional Cardiologists, as well as the ACC Interventional Council. So all of you that are interventionists should join Sky and get involved because you have a role in those. The second thing I'll add on this is uh, a couple years ago, we had a consensus statement on ambulatory surgery centers. And in that, we strongly recommended that you keep track of that in many states. And so, in fact, I think Michigan and um, Pennsylvania, when they pass the um, ambulatory surgery center things, are requiring a certification and quality reporting. So I think that's a focus, and I think from a sky standpoint, we believe that's important. And I think, as you mentioned in Michigan, so they have the Blue Cross Blue Shield. They keep the data for all those patients. So I, I wonder if that's another way to kind of look at what the outcomes are and uh, you know how do we develop and improve. I think we need to move forward. Manas, did you want no, to say one question something? Question, some text from many people. You know, many people are asking the basic question: What's the difference between OBL and ASC? Yeah. So. Like I said, the OBLs are office-based labs and they're mandated by state requirements. ASC is a little bit higher and they are mandated by um, the Medicare at the federal level. So those, that's the difference. But in terms of the cases, as I mentioned, really not much of a difference in what you can take on um, uh, in terms of cases and what equipment is available. So can PCI be performed also at OBLs or only ASCs? Yeah, you can do PCIs in OBLs. Um, all those non-complex stuff that I talked about can be done in OBLs, out office-based labs as well. And they only have a balloon pump and, and very... But physically, minimal. they look the same, right? I OBL think, yeah, I would say so. Yeah. All right, I think we're going to move forward. Um, thank you so much. That's really a great understanding of things. Um, so the next 
The next speaker will be my co-moderator, Dimit Dr. Dimitri Feldman. He'll be talking about the position statement from Sky on best practices for clinical proctoring. Thank you so much. And uh, to uh, echo what uh, Dr. Henry said, you know, Sky really has expanded its scope in terms of writing the guidelines, the expert consensus documents that truly speak to our membership. And, and this is one of them, a position statement on the best practices for proctoring. Now, whether you're in the coronary field, peripheral field, or structural field, um, at some point you will be proctored or you will be a proctor for new technology, for new procedures, but how do we do it safely? What are the requirements um, is what really this document is guiding us. And any new treatment in any sphere, you know, there's gonna be some didactic and observational teaching and hands-on experience down the line. And this is where the medical proctor is gonna come in handy. So in 2022, Skype put together this document, and I want to give credit to Dr. Arnold Sato and, and Sunil Rao for leading this effort, but there was a multi, um, exper very experienced multi-specialty group that worked on this. And the purpose really was um, to outline uh, what the scope uh, and what the proctoring should look like. Number one, the goal of proctoring is really patient access, patient access to new technology, how to do it safely, and how to make sure that patients get the technology, the best treatment in the best hands possible. Number two, educate all the stakeholders regarding the risks of medical proctoring. Number three, recommend what are the best practices to reduce the potential for adverse events, misunderstanding, conflicts of interest, all the questions that we typically ask as a proctor or as someone who's being proctored. So the document will cover some legal considerations, some roles and responsibilities, not just of the proctor, but of the host, physician, host institution, and what the industry role is. And it really goes into the pre, intra, and post-procedural best practices. I'll, I'll touch just uh, sort of uh, superficially what it covers um, and, and, and highlight all the important things. But just to, uh, uh, for specifics, the preceptor in terms of terminology is really a teacher. Preceptor is, as we often do, and like in ACGME accredited medical education program, we as teachers serve as preceptors to our trainees, to the residents, to the fellows, um, where we provide either formal, hands-on um, teaching whereas the proctor is really there to evaluate and not necessarily to teach, okay? And this is a very important distinction. So the proctor traditionally, traditionally, have no formal role for patient's care and outcomes, and they're solely the responsibility of the primary operator. Now, of course, when and how the proctor does it in a specific setting, that differs, and that's where the responsibilities have to be delineated. Yes, the proctor can be perhaps retrospectively just reviewing the cases that already completed, looking at the indication, procedural records, the appropriateness of procedure, etc. So very sort of superficial review. Or they can observe the cases on site without being scrubbed in or without being very involved in the case. Or they can observe the cases from the procedure, from the control room, being outside but not necessarily scrubbing in, or there may be a very uh, active participation with hands-on portions being scrubbed in, actually, uh, actually touching you know, the procedural components. So all of that, all of that, uh, of course, has implication on medical legal risk. So if the question is what are the medical legal risks to the proctor, and of, of course this question comes up both from the people who are getting proctored as well as from, for the proctors themselves, well, you have to answer several questions. Number one, will the proctor scrub in into the case and be involved in performing the procedure, either as a primary operator or as an assistant? And if the question, the answer is yes, then the proctor, proctor is really practicing medicine and will likely need, number one, medical license, will need credentialing by the host institution, and malpractice insurance to cover those activities, right? If the answer is no, will the proctor provide some guidance to the primary operator and offer suggestions during the case without scrubbing in? If the answer is no, then proctor is probably just an observer. He's not practicing medicine and should not require a local medical license. The credentialing by the host institution may not necessarily be required, but this is also up to the institution. The risk of being improperly sued for malpractice is very low, but it's not zero. Um, and it differs by the state, of course, and a lawyer was involved and in part of the writing document here, but 
The laws are somewhat different in different states, so this is really not a medical legal document. But if the patient deteriorates and the proctor assumes the active role during the uh, participation, then a good Samaritan law will uh, probably take place. But somewhere in the middle, depending if the proctor is there in the control room and does uh, provide some suggestion, then the legal uh, ramification are somewhat in the gray zone. So uh, if you want to answer the questions, what are the kind of things that you can do to reduce the medical legal risks. Um, then on the left side you will see, and this document has a nice table that will delineate that. So if the proctor doesn't scrub in into the case or lay hands on the patient, if the proctor doesn't have any direct patient interaction, if the proctor doesn't make any entry in the medical records, if the proctor doesn't receive compensation, if the proctor is listed as an observer, all those things will put you in a category where you're gonna be less medically liable. On the other hand, if the proctor is actually scrubs in into the case and lays hands on the patient, if the proctor has direct patient interaction, if he's listed as an assistant in the medical record, um, then those will make those medical legal ramification a little bit more likely in case something happens during the case. This is a table that's very important uh, for those institutions, for those uh, physicians who are gonna be either proctored or will be um, acting as a proctor. So the checklist is really created both for the proctor, for the host physician, for the host institution, and the industry uh, supporters. And it truly goes over what should take place before the proctorship initiated. And this is not a checklist that should be done on the day of the proctorship. This should be done way in advance so that all the rules are delineated way before what the proctor should do, what the host physician should do, what kind of credentialing is necessary, what kind of malpractice is necessary, who should be covering the malpractice. All the questions are listed there, and um, it will be very helpful both for the host physician and for the proctor to go through this and, and communicate this to each other so that on the day of proctorship, everybody's ready and know what they need to do. Uh, what's the role of professional societies like Sky? Well, the role is to clearly establish guidelines for which emerging procedures require pro proctor and collaborate with our industry partners in defining, endorsing, and certifying the qualification criteria for proctors and the trainees. And importantly, to lead the expert consensus efforts to develop protocols um, that make sure that proctorship is safe both for our patients, that's number one, but both for the host physicians and for the proctors. Thank you. Dimitri, this is great. And I, I, I think it's a really, we, we want it all the time. We want that learning. We want that proctoring. And um, there are so many new devices. I'm going to open it up to the panel. Um, Simon, uh, what's your experience proctoring or being proctored? And do you have any comments on the documents? So Dimitri, uh, I've both been proctored and been a proctor for various technologies, and I think it's really, really helpful to have this document, so congratulations, and thank you for the work for that together. Um, I have a question for you and for the group that um, articulate the document. We have many other, the, the term proctor really applies to the physicians involved in those procedures, but we have many other healthcare professionals involved in our procedures, for example, structural interventions where the valve may be prepared, even brought to the table, and, um, and I just wonder whether the group had any discussion about the ramifications of this kind of document for other personnel involved in our procedures, medical legal risk, and so forth. Yeah, no, this is a great question, and, and, and this is, uh, as you've mentioned, comes in particularly important in the, in the structural interventions, the new interventions that are being developed, uh, mitral space, tricuspid space. Uh, the document touches on it, um, and actually the roles of the uh, uh, industry partners and, and those who are acting on behalf of the industry, um, people who work with the you know, specific valve devices, prepare the devices, are actually also there in terms of the checklist um, so that the expectations, what they will be doing, what kind of role they will have during the procedure is all uh, taken care of and delineated before the procedure, before the actual proctorship so that there are no surprises, so that the cath lab, the staff, everybody knows who will be coming into the case what everybody's role is, you know, everybody's name and everybody's role, so that there are no surprises, and, and that's the important part. Are there any questions from the audience? 
I have a quick question, actually. Um, what, what do you think um, the obligation is in terms of all sorts of proctoring, from proctoring from healthcare professionals to physicians, to then discuss that with patient, and, and how clearly should that be discussed with the patient? Yeah, and that's that's a I think a, a terrific terrific question and a very important one. And I think you know from the uh, uh, medical legal standpoint, I think as open and as thorough and as transparent that discussion is, um, is gonna truly impact on any medical legal ramifications in the future. So I think the patient, the family, everybody should be in the loop understanding this is a new technology, this is what the experience of the physician doing the procedure is, this is how they prepare for the procedure. But you're gonna have you know, a proctor, uh, a, an industry uh, medical uh, specialist, you're gonna have these, these kind of uh, preparation during this procedure, this is a new pr uh, procedure, this is how many has been done in this institution, this is how many has been done nationally or internationally, so that everybody's on the same page and, and the patient and the family understand that this is uh, you know, an emerging technology which would not be available uh, in any other setting. It may not be FDA approved. It may be on clinical trial, on clinical registry. Yeah. So as uh, transparent as it can be, uh, I think will prevent in case something does happen during the case uh, that will uh, truly reduce the medical clinical ramifications. Just one comment. I just want to say that protein is extremely important. This is the way that we bring technologies once we finish our fellowship. We, we are mid-career and more advanced career. We can learn CTOs on the job. We can learn uh, new valve technologies in the job. So I think that having this type of uh, document that provides a framework for that activity is, is very important. Yeah, and with that, I think I'm going to move on to my talk. Can I ask talk. one question? Sorry, oh, so, sorry. So actually, so Dimitri, if I understood correctly, the term we're using is wrong. We shouldn't be say proctorship. We should preceptorship, right? Because at least, for me, the main reason is you are teaching people. So technically, as you mentioned, right? Am I understanding this correctly? I, I think you know it depends on um, you know whether the position is really teaching or whether they are really evaluating, right? The 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 preceptor is really the teacher, um, and the precept uh, and the proctor is really an evaluator. Now, of course, there is a gradation, and how you know, involved the proctor is, is where that gradation sort of between the preceptor and the proctor. So someone may start as a proctor, but end up being a preceptor for a certain case. Um, but I think, you know, uh, a priori defining what that role will be in terms of whether it's truly just an evaluation and observation, or whether it's teaching and hands-on assistant with the, hell, uh, with, with the case is what's, what's truly important. All right, let me introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Thomas Holland will talk to us about the ACC AHA Sky Advanced Training Statement on Interventional Cardiology. And this will transition nicely on, on what the requirements are, um, current requirements for both coronary, structural, and, uh, and uh, endovascular procedures. Yeah, so I think that this is a great transition because actually your talk should have followed my talk because my talk is about the training, but actually training is a lifelong training. And, you know, basically this document, it really talks about the minimal amount of training, recognizing that you're going to continue to go through your career and train. So this uh, document came out. Let's see if I can get this to go forward. Okay, so this document came out this past uh, uh, spring, and it was a combination of multiple societies coming together and trying to figure out the best components for training for interventional cardiology. So just as a little bit of background, there's COCATS, you're probably familiar with the COCATS training. That's for general cardiology, and there are different components of the COCATS training. There's some uh, sort of components outlining what you should be experiencing in the cath lab and what you should be experiencing in your peripheral work, but this, um, this is beyond that. This is after you're done with your COCATS, after you're done with your general cardiology fellowship, what is the document? So in COCATS, they talk about level one and level two training in the cath lab, but the level three training is not discussed, and this is the document for level three training. So, as I said, you go through your fellowship. 
You can either be level one or level two training in your general cardiology fellowship. Everybody gets level one trained in general cardiology for the cath lab, meaning you've been in the cath lab, you know how to read an angiogram, and you know the indications for the procedure and the risks of the procedure. But if you want to do level two training in your general cardiology fellowship, you can get, you need uh, uh, 300 procedures and you need at least six months in the lab and you can come away being an invasive cardiologist. And that's generally what's recommended, level two training before you go on to level three. And most of us do do a lot of time in the cath lab in our third year before we go on to our level three training. So level three training is the interventional cardiology training. And it, what it requires is it requires formally one year of training plus a minimum number. So the combination of the two, you can't just do the numbers and less time, and you can't just do the time but not have the numbers. Now the minimal numbers are a little tricky to understand, but basically the minimal numbers of PCI, of procedures, should be, intervention should be 250. 200 PCI procedures, and 50 additional interventions. So if you choose to be, at, if you are at a program that only does interventions, then you're gonna need 250 PCIs. If you're at a program that does do some peripheral, recognizing that the skills you develop from doing your peripheral will be translated to the skills you have for PCI, you can do 200 PCIs and 50 peripheral to make your 250, and similarly with structural. But the minimal number is 250, and I really emphasize minimal, minimal, and I'll say it one more time, minimal. I think that the proctoring, the ongoing you know, oversight for, and recognizing your limitations and the need to improve your learning after you graduate is important. Then we go on to have additional training for the additional years. So assuming you will want to do peripheral structural, you really do want additional training, you want additional time, generally a year of additional training for structural or peripheral. And uh, I'm not gonna go into details because I don't have that much time in terms of the speaking, but you can see that there's certain minimal procedural requirements for peripheral and for structural. And additionally, there's more procedural requirements if you wanted to do adult congenital. So the document highlights all of these things. So again, the components of the training, they sort of, re they spend a lot of time going through the didactics, the, the structure, the clinical part, and the uh, procedural part. You need all three. A training program needs to be able to provide this, the fellows with didactic training, so lectures or availability to conference online or uh, online learning, et cetera. You need to have clinical, so they definitely encourage pre- and post-procedure care, outpatient care, et cetera, and you need to have procedural learning. So you need all of those to be a training program. Then they go on to go into more details, and again, without, you know, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into the details, but they will go on to details to talk about the different components of your training and what you need. So you, um, in, this, in this document, they talk about just procedural, understanding how to do plaque modification, what's available to you, what you should be doing, the complications, how to handle complications, being familiar with snare techniques, pericardiocentesis, covered stents, all of the different components of training that you really need to know. And they do that the same, and I'm sorry if I uh, sort of lessen the peripheral and structural part, because, but I do want to say that they do the same thing. They go into more details about the components you need to master peripheral and structural. I use the word master. I'm actually wrong here um, because it's not a master. You're going to learn for a lifetime. Um, competency. They have tables. So we have milestones in cardiology, similarly in interventional cardiology. In your first year, they have milestones of what you should be reaching, and that's based on the six competencies. So what should your milestone be in medical care, in patient care, in um, medical knowledge, et cetera. And then they have that extra column to the right, as the far right, as you can see, are the extra, the, the t things you should learn in your future years that you don't have to master in your first year if you're going to do peripheral, but you do need to master if you end up doing peripheral. You do need to master it in subsequent years. So again, this is a multi-society document. Um, it really it has a lot of flexibility. When I say about that extra year of training, whether it's peripheral or structural, it doesn't have to follow interventional. If you did a year of peripheral before you went into interventional, that's okay. But in order to be a structuralist or, an inter or a peripheralist, you have to have done the one year of interventional cardiology, whether it was before, after, or three years later. It really, really emphasizes the importance of 
being you know, a lifelong learner, understanding these are absolute minimal requirements. And what we really want to do is to be sure that you continue to grow and develop and learn over time. And if you're coming out of a program that doesn't do high risk, they want you to recognize that you need to be prepared to con have continued proctoring and learning to do your high risk work. And that's it. That's awesome. Jacqueline, let me uh, start by one question for you and, and for our panelists. I think a very common question from, from um, uh, graduates, uh, from the fellows is, can within one year of training, um, we get a full coronary uh, training plus partly a peripheral, let's say, low extremity uh, procedural training or structural or partly structural training such as TAVERS, um, or are we truly moving towards one coronary year plus a peripheral year or a structural year or a year focusing on CHIP and complex coronary interventions? Yeah, so I, I, I think that right now, you know, a lot of what mandates how many years, whether you actually need a formal year or not, is board certification. And since there aren't board certification for structural yet, I don't think that you, you know, actually have to have, you know, technically have to have it. But I think we all want to, you know, let's face it, if you, if you do a year of training, the chances are you need that you need that extra time. You're not going to master all of the techniques. Um, so I, I think we're fooling ourselves, but right now, technically, if you get the numbers that are required and you uh, come away, you could technically practice because there's not a mandate to say. I don't think structural. I think for peripheral, I see some of the fellows finishing up and being able to practice. But um, we, in the statement, really formally encourage additional years of training rather than saying you packed it all into one year. I think it's really f strongly encouraged, but because there's no board certification, people can do what they need to do. Great. So I would like to bring up for discussion so in major meetings, we, the, the two most important tracks for coronary are intravascular imaging and plaque modification for severely calcified lesions. But in these documents, apparently, you can uh, be certified as an interventional cardiologist having performed just 25 Im imaging cases like IVUS or OCT. Uh, and there is no clear requirement for uh, plaque modification. So I think this is a gap that if we as a society want to uh, promote imaging and plaque modification and do a better job at training our trainees, we should set much higher bars for, for imaging and plaque modification. Yeah, I, I wanted to add on to the, the endovascular component. I think, um, you know, really not having that extra time, and I know it's hard to then add on more years of training because, you know, you're, many of us are training for a decade nearly. Um, but, you know, when you're looking at 50 interventions with the nuances that come with tibial work, SFA work, iliac work, 25 carotids with the nuances and potential complications that can arise from that. I think it's a little concerning that we're not in, in some ways treating endovascular. Um, and with all the hubbub, I think that's been um, brought up recently, I think really important to start thinking about if it doesn't make sense to somehow um, to put an extra year, extra time period for that, that training. Yeah, and I, I think that's, again, why I think Dimitri's thing on proctoring is so important, Dimitri's statement, his talk, because what you're saying is absolutely true. I think we struggled a lot with that. There are a lot of programs that don't have that capability to provide somebody with CHIP, and it's clearly written in the document that if you did not come away with CHIP training, that you really need to recognize you need to be proctored in the future or do an additional CHIP year. And, you know, and I think you struggle with the balance between trying to, uh, you know, allow programs across the country to provide training while at the same time ensuring that the training is good. Tim, yep. did you have a question? Oh, yeah, I would like to say, yeah, but proctoring for coronary, there's no more coronary proctoring from doctors. It's only the people uh, from the industry that provide this kind of training. So if you're stuck in a program where they do like maybe 10 rota, rota cases a year, then you miss on the opportunity of being trained and you will never get that training anymore unless you engage in a CHIP fellowship, which, as we all know, are very limited in this country. We cannot just rely on the industry for, for training for a thorectomy or imaging, for example. I think well, that's that, a, the, okay. yeah, the same uh, issue and, and problem sort of is, is in the endovascular peripheral world, right? Uh, there are very few 
uh, experience centers uh, national that focus on CLI, let's say. There are a few centers that will provide training uh, enough uh, to give training in carotid stenting, let's say at least 25 procedure, or in the uh, AAA EVAR management, at least 20 procedures. Drew, what do you think, you know, how do we tackle that? Those who are interested in, in complex endovascular procedures, carotid stenting, EVARs, um, how do they go about obtaining that training? You know, I think the importance here is obviously having programs set up at high volume centers. You know, you can go to Chris Metzger's uh, work with him and do carotid stuff. What I find interesting enough is how are we going to handle this with pulmonary embolism, right? It's not even listed in those guidelines here. Uh, and this is a very important space that a lot of us are in, and how, there's nothing listed in any of the guidelines about it. So I do think to echo Jennifer's uh, sentiments that we really do, do need more training for it. I think for centers that are experts in CLI, um, as well as whatever it may be, EVAR, I don't do EVAR, so for me to get into EVAR, I'm gonna have to learn from somebody. And either it can be at your institution, ideally, or go somewhere else. And I think it's important to work through our societies, specifically in Sky, so that we can contact and know who these people are. So that if you wanna go and get carotid stenting, you know you can go see Chris. If you wanna go and do EVAR, then um, maybe it's to someone else. So I think it's important that we have a clear backup for our, our members, but also understanding that it takes time, it takes volume. Uh, as new procedures come around, like BPA for chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, I mean, I'm starting a program at my institution, so I'm gonna be flying to Michigan, I'm gonna be doing different places. So you have to be able to make sure that we can evolve uh, in this space and do it in a safe fashion. Right. Mauricio, the structural. Uh, tell us about, like, because there's so many new technologies. Yep. TAVR is one thing, but MitraClip is another. Tell us what you... Yeah, exactly. So you can think a structural. Structural is very broad. And if you learn TAVR, that doesn't mean that you can do a micro procedure because the, the, the skill set is completely different. So you need to learn how to do a transeptal. Uh, in the other case, you need to do uh, you need to do just cross aortic valve that we you know that we learned. You need to learn about uh, large bore access. So it's completely different. You cannot expect just to come out of one year of interventional fellowship and be able to master uh, uh, structural with just uh, having done 20 procedures or 25 procedures that are you know under the umbrella of structural because the, the skills that don't 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 cross over to the other to the other procedure. So you have tricuspids, it's becoming so, so complex that uh, the devices, the procedures, the patients are also very different. And also you have to master uh, the imaging, uh, imaging like uh, TEE, ECHO, ICE, and, and CT. So it's, 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 a, it's a whole new world. So you cannot expect that in one year. Poonam, come. Yeah, great talk, Jackie. And this is just piggybacking on uh, Lorenzo's comment. We've given a lot of, um, this document is about training and how many procedures for fellows, but is there any guidelines for programs? Why are programs that don't have enough number of, you know, imaging or um, a physiology testing, is there some, you know, guidelines for which programs can actually train fellows or have a fellowship program? Because 200 even seems very low for PCI because fellows keep blogging cases where they're second operators. I mean, you learn from every case, but is that, I feel like 200 is even low. Yeah, I, 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 I do tend to agree, but I think that it's 250, right, if you're a program that's just doing coronary. So it's 250, and they do require that you have imaging. And in the document, they, requ they require that you have, you know, certain, certain procedural techniques. Um, so I, I do agree that uh, there, you know, it's relatively loose on what the programs need to have, but there are some details about what within the program, what they need to be able to pro provide and what they need to otherwise be able to provide by didactics, you know, so knowledge of how to handle a complication because a complication of a perforation may be very rare and a fellow may not see it in an entire year unless they're working with Khaldun, but <laughs> because I've heard he said his fellows see a lot, but you know, so you might rarely see anything, but, uh, but they need to at least have a sort of knowledge of how to handle this. It, it, it's hard because not every program has the ability to have you exposed to everything. Tim? So this is such an important topic. I wasn't involved with either of these documents, but they're both fantastic. And they're controversial ones and to get on paper. The fact is about training, all of us, even the young ones on the, on the, on the panel right now, I'm thinking, 
you are doing stuff every day that didn't even exist when you were in training, right, Drew? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. And so th th we really have to work on in terms of is lifelong learning. And um, uh, I'll put another plug in. Dr. Feldman is the chair of the uh, publications committee. And so there's the, a, a very standardized uh, process that goes about how you think about documents and how they go through. But another really important one that's in process right now is simulation. And there's a lot, uh, there was a previous document about 10 years ago, but there's a lot of new technology in terms of how we learn. It, like imaging, for example, is a great point, right? And there's not, and so I think this is another really good document that should be out within the next year about um, ways that we can learn to stay for, um, to give you, to be able to do the complex new procedures. Thank you, Tim. And um, I think we'll um, we'll go on to our last last but not least talk, and this will be Dr. Chadi Alris talking to us about sky position statement on best practices in percutaneous axillary arterial access and training. Also, very important document. Thank you so much for having me. All right, these are the slides. So uh, how many of you have been doing or done axillary access for large bore? Uh, OK, a few people. And it's coming kind of uh, less uh, used lately because of the utilization of IVL and for large bore. But it still has a value. But this is a recap for what already Dimitri spoke about proctorship. This is about uh, what uh, Mauricio talked about, the new technology and evolving field that we have uh, right now in interventional cardiology, that you have to learn new skills. And the number doesn't matter as more as you are doing it right and learning from the people who have done it before. But we know that PAD is very prevalent in patients with TAVR and patients who are coming for any uh, large bore access. Uh, up to one-third, one in three people have severe PAD that could be occlusive. But also, sometimes you come across tortuosity and uh, some difficult access for patients coming for TAVR or for uh, high-risk PCI that require impella or mechanical support. So the, the two alternatives that we have been using, or majority of us has been using in either transcable, which is, uh, 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 that has been developed in Henry Ford and has been utilized largely for large bore or accelerated access. So because of the, the current guidelines and because of the proctorship concerns about how many you should do and who should supervise this, this access uh, training, uh, our, with the chair of Arnold Sero kind of put it together, we put together this document just to kind of summarize the literature and also put the best practice and what are the stepwise approach for this axis. So I'm not going to walk you through the axis itself step by step, but just going to highlight what the document has shared uh, just to give you kind of a roadmap in case you have or run into this uh, issue. So this is the aim basically, just to make sure this is a roadmap for you in case you need to use this axis in the future. So if we have to go to learn about access, it's really it's very important to learn about anatomy. And uh, this is an illustration from the paper itself. Uh, nicely illustrate the three segments of the axillary artery. It has three, three segments that are separated by the pectoralis minor that separates the axillary artery to proximal, mid, and distal, axis, distal segments. The, if you overlap the fluoroscopy over the anatomy, your goal is to access the axillary artery in the mid segment. And there is a reasoning behind it because you are away from the large nerve bundle that's going to cause can, can cause any uh, neurological damage, but also it's in the area where it's compressible and also large enough to deliver your sheath. So this is again some anatomical variations, but it's still uh, the, the, as you see in the bottom, accelerate give you six to seven milli, uh, millimeter vessel, which are, can accommodate up to 24 sheaths. It depends on men or women. Again, the, the selective angiography is something you should do initially if you are in doubt, if this artery is healthy. Uh, obviously, if your patient has a lima, you have to avoid the left arm. Uh, you have to stick with the right arm and so forth. But it, majority, and this is recommended in the publication as well, is to use the left arm because it's more straightforward and uh, avoid a lot of tertiosity, especially in patients with short aorta or short root or tertiosity coming in. Because of the anomaly, we can come across coming from the right side. So why we use that segment? There is definitely not randomized trial for it, but this segment is recommended, which is the middle segment of the axillary artery in one, because it's uh, compressible. You can easily compress it by hand in case there is a bleeding when you remove the sheath. And two, because it's away from the uh, nerve bundle, so neurological damage can be less. 
uh, but also it, uh, it lowered the risk of pneumothorax because you are away from the ribs. So that, again, this is based on practice, a tribe, uh, and this is, again, from the experience of the uh, colleagues who put this document together. What is, in terms of access, has few steps, very simple. Abduction is very important, and has, the arm has to be stretched all the way at 90 degrees. To a, that will help you stretch uh, the any tortuosity and also bring up the axillary artery a little bit up so it becomes closer to the surface, and there is no heavy tissue or the muscles are thinner. So when you are accessing, especially when you are driving that heavy sheath, you will not come across a lot of tension or pressure. Micropunctual, highly recommended in and, and, and this procedure for sure because that will help you to make sure on the right segment. And again, in terms of the access, in the femoral or radial access, cellular ringer technique usually in the 60 to 70, 70 degrees access, but here you have to be very shallow and you have to come very parallel to the vessel. Why? Because there's a lot of tissue between the skin and the muscle and the artery, and this is, will help you kind of become parallel and driving the large sheath very easily without resistance. Finally, uh, shallow access, I mentioned earlier, these are two points. An insertion technique, either you can do femoral access or contralateral radial access and do an angio kind of 50-50 puff to see where is your access is, where is the point of access is, or you can use ultrasound or combined. We recommend combined technique, especially if somebody has good creatinine. If somebody has abnormal creatinine or limited contrast, then you have to stick with the ultrasound. So the ultrasound is also illustrated very nicely. It has two, three vis that come out with a vein and artery above each other, but the more you compress, and you see that's a very nice illustration there by uh, the, the authors is about the ultrasound has to compress really deep, so good sedation is required because it can be hurt, hurting the patient as well. Uh, so you have to be very uh, close to the, to, the, to the joint, but again, keeping in mind the landmark that I mentioned, you have to be very lateral to the thoracoacromial artery for access. Pre-closure is recommended, especially if there is a recommendation for patients to leave it in for a short period of time for a recovery from a shock or something. But also, suture base is highly recommended. The plug base uh, uh, closure is less favorable uh, in these uh, areas. Dry closure is recommended for, uh, for, for when you are coming out from, when you are done with the procedure. So dry closure technique, we learned it from the femoral space, is you come up with a six or seven French sheath in the femoral, you balloon, you cross it with a heavy wire, the, the access point, and then you advance the balloon that size one to one, so six or eight or nine, depends on the vessel, men or women. And then once you are cross, you inflate, you inflate it at very low pressures, usually two to four atmospheres is enough, and you see it on fluoroscopy because you don't want to inflate it too much and rupture the artery. Once you achieve hemostasis, usually we connect the side arm of the axis sheath with the pressure transducer. If your pressure is flattened, that means you are occlusive. You pull the sheath out and you keep and you, you keep that for a few minutes. If you wanna, if you already deploy the pre-closure, you can do it. If you are planning just for balloon tamponade, that can be done as well. Definitely, there is a, a risk for um, a bleeding sometimes, and manual pressure can be applied. The, we, rec we, did not we don't recommend routine manual pressure. We recommend a closure, a suture-based closure. But if needed, this is, can be applied uh, if you want to reverse uh, anticoagulation, inflation for TAVR. Apparently, if you're doing PCI, you don't, we don't recommend reversing ACT. Bleeding is one big one, and usually can be managed with balloon tamponade only. So if you deflate and do a puff with a distal balloon, uh, usually you see some perforation and kind of extravasation of the contrast. But again, if what you can do, you can advance the balloon to the arteriotomy side, inflate at one-to-one, -one, and stay, keep it there up to 15 minutes. In the document, we recommend the 15 to 20 minutes because there is some collaterals that help perfusing the arm. If needed, cover stent as can be a bailout strategy. We try to avoid this as much as we can because definitely can cover some important branches. And again, short stent can be used, but longer could, is recommended. The reason why, because sometimes there is a tear on the artery, I need to cover that. But two, it's very important to stay very distal from a vertebral artery, not to close the perfusion to the brain. Again, the summary, as I said, the document I would highly recommend if anybody interested, it's really a very practical step-by-step -step approach for a patient to get, for, for a physician to get access. Um, if you have any, uh, uh, de the details, as I mentioned, this is a top 10,000 10, foot view, but if you want to go details, what she size, what indication for these procedures, and also how to bail out strategies are all detailed in the document. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chatty.
Um, you know, we talked about proctoring. Um, for this kind of uh, procedure, for operators who haven't done uh, transaxillary procedures, what is the recommendation in terms of proctoring? Do you need it? How many? Well, I mean, we, we didn't uh, specifically, as you say, this is subjective and very depends on the comfort level of the operator. Uh, we definitely recommend having a proctor for the first case you do, especially if you're, this is your first time and you, you have a concern about, uh, are not familiar with anatomy with ultrasound, which is highly recommended. Uh, so proctoring maybe for the first case at least is, is um, highly recommended, but in terms of number, it's not stated in the document. Yeah, I can share my own experience, how I learned it myself. So it was uh, post, immediately post-COVID, so there was no possibility of proctoring. Um, so there are a few presentations that, uh, for example, some companies uh, uh, can share with you guys and uh, with basically what you just outlined. So it's very important that you uh, study the theory behind it. Then perhaps, you know, just touch basing over the phone with some experienced operator will help. And for sure, the also numerically, the, the field where uh, transaxillary access is used the most is for balloon pumps many more balloon pumps than impellas and, and TAVR probably. So in the initial cases should be like a balloon pump where you know the sticks are lower, the, sh the sheath side is, is smaller, and you don't even need a preclosure because these are going to stay in for an extended period of time. You can always post-close after because it's just eight French. And when you master that with a, you know, a 10 cases, I think you can move on for TAVR or MCS as needed. Simon, uh, do you have any thoughts on the uh, transaxillary? No. And Mauricio, I know you said you've done so, something. So, so I'm going to say something maybe, maybe you may not like it, but I, I like to have a surgeon when I do a tavern um, and, and help me with access. Without the interposition graft, you can, the surgeon can, can make an incision that is about one inch. You stick above, you stick on the direct vision, uh, the vessel and then it's closed with the purse string suture and the direct vision. And that, I found that to be a very, very safe procedure uh, as opposed to using a per close or, 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 or leaving something that is not completely secure. So that's the way I've, I've done the transaxillary towers now. In my institution, my new institutions, we put lots of balloon pumps, so you have to do it blindly. But for large bore, I think uh, I enjoyed having the surgeon with a small incision that doesn't make that much of a difference with with half the size of an incision that you need for a 20, for, for the 14 or 15 French. That's interesting. Um, do you have any information on the complication rates in uh, large volume centers during large bore access? What so it's, it's documented in the, in, the, in the paper as well. Uh, it, the reported uh, thrombosis is 1%. Uh, especially if it is short time. If you, you are leaving this for a long time, let's, as you mentioned, uh, if you have balloon pump or if somebody has, uh, you're putting it for recovery, uh, uh, can go up to 5% thrombosis. So ACT is very critical. Two stroke is also uh, pretty, not negligible. It's 1%, but if you're also keeping it for a longer period of time, it's up to 7%. And also depends on the sheath size. So the smaller is the better because you are perfusing around the sheath, but if not. A third one is ischemic limb. If somebody has PAD or have a disease in the subclavian artery that's not perfusing well, so ischemic limb can happen, and ischemia can happen up to 2%. We listed in the document also some bailout strategy, how to perfuse distally. So you have preemptively putting a radial artery and perfusing from the mother, kind of feeding the large bore, feeding the small bore. Uh, but again, this is, can be illustrated in the paper. But to, to recap on the uh, uh, starting I think a small, small sheet is recommended, but also we always, the first two cases, always have a surgeon, vascular or cardiovascular, in your room uh, because they can bail you out. Uh, and I think they have been very perceptive of that. Chatty, I'll just echo the, um, and kind of what you said in terms of starting off with balloon pumps. And I think the key thing is you got to make certain that if you're going to do this, you have the backup that needs to be there. Five bonds, for instance, are great bailouts. but. Some go through 035s, and some are 8 French, some are 7 French, some are 018s, and you got to make certain you realize that before you get going. So having the right expertise in your room, so if you're a structuralist and you don't have a lot of experience in that, call your peripheral endovascular specialist. But I think the interposition graph by far makes it a lot easier for those who are doing TAVR. That's a very important point, especially be familiar with the sheath size for the via band stent you're placing because at beyond six, you need a seven French, for example. So you have to keep it, that in mind. And what I recommend uh, in the paper is self-expanding stent. 
not balloon expanding, because it avoid uh, uh, any compression, because it's a flexion point, if it is long enough, so to avoid any occlusion. That's great. Um, I just want to mention that uh, um, there is a document uh, that uh, Sky is uh, currently working on. It's a, a alternative access document for structural procedure, but it will uh, encompass some of the transaxillary access, transcarotid, and transcable. So that's just something to look forward to. Um, I want to thank all uh, panelists, my co-moderator, and everybody in the audience for joining this outstanding session. Um, and thank you for joining CVI.